Hello, this is a prepaid call from... Martin Gottesfeld. An inmate at the Plymouth County Jail. To accept this call, press zero. To refuse this call, hang up. Your current balance is $24.75. This call is from a correction facility and is subject to monitoring and recording. Thank you for using Global Telling. I'm Marty Gottesfeld. And Dana Gottesfeld. And welcome to Season 2, Episode 1 of Incarcerated, the one and only podcast recorded directly from federal prison at 20-something cents per minute or some other ungodly rate. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to just jump right into it today. Um, I had a hearing today in Boston Federal Court. I uh, submitted a lengthy motion uh, applying for new counsel and kind of delineating the reasons why, and uh, the judge decided to, to hold a hearing on it. Um, but the most interesting event, I think, today, um, as I entered the courtroom and crossed the prosecutor's table, uh, were Adam J. Bookbinder and David Diadio, the two very Harvard-affiliated people um, who have chosen to overlook the vicious torture of Justina Pelletier that left this then 15-year-old child in a wheelchair, unfortunately, probably for the rest of her life, uh, instead to prosecute the guy who allegedly brought down a website to try to um, exact a financial toll um, on the torturers and can get them to stop. Um, as I crossed their table, uh, Dana, who was in the courtroom as well, uh, lifted up two uh, large-sized pictures of Justina, one before going into Boston Children's Hospital when she was ice skating beautifully, and one, you know, during her confinement there with her hair falling out in her wheelchair. And uh, as Dana raised those pictures up, I looked right at uh, Bookbinder. Uh, I said, you know, Mr. Bookbinder, look, can you even look at Justina? And, uh, you know, what, what I saw was him quickly kind of turn, look at Dana, see the picture of Justina, and then turn forward again, eyes look right down, like, just in shock. Um, <laughs> and the U.S. Marshals are, like, pulling on my shirt, tugging on my shirt, trying to get me to sit down, <laughs> like, sit down, sit down, sit down. So I, I went on, you know, a little bit, just kind of asking, you know, whether this man has any conscience. Uh, and saying, you know, you and your people tortured this girl. You're affiliated with her torturers. You're covering up for her torturers. Um and, and Bookbinder would not, or Diadio, either one of them, they would not look at me for the rest of the hearing. I was looking directly at them for the most part for the rest of the hearing, except when I had to address the judge. Um, and they just they just kept their eyes down and kept their eyes forward. I know. They, were, our, they, were, they yeah. were so uncomfortable from what I saw. <laughs> well, as torturers should be. Um, and after our little uh, video comparing uh, Bookbinder to Pee Wee Herman, uh, he didn't speak a single word today. Like, he didn't want to be on the, the court recording system. Uh, apparently, Pee Wee doesn't like uh, talking in his playhouse. Yeah. Um, but, Dana, they, they took you out of the courtroom for, for lifting up two signs, which you would think are two pictures. But you didn't say a word, right? You didn't actually disrupt anybody or anything. You just, and this is before the judge is in the courtroom, right? So the, the, the meeting or the conference or the hearing has not been called to order. There's no proceeding running happening beforehand, right? The judge isn't even in the room at this point. And Dana stands up with these, these two enlarged pictures of Justina, and they are in the courtroom for that. As I'm, as I'm asking questions to the bookbinder, the American public is, is probably, I would imagine, kind of curious about too. But, Dana, what happened when they took you out of the courtroom? Um, one of the... Uh the clerks or whatever, uh, pulled me out and he asked for my license and he took down my information. And then he's like, wait here, I'm going to get the marshal. I said, okay. Uh, and I just kind of sat at the bench and then uh, a marshal comes out. He was wearing a pink tie. He's like, don't do that. Can you not do that again? <laughs> I said, I'm like, okay. He's like, Okay. <laughs> He's like, you can come back in. But they made me um, drop my bags in, like, a side room. Okay. See, I don't think they're constitutionally allowed to do that. 
especially because the hearing had not actually been called to order yet. And it's you stood up with a couple of signs. You didn't actually say anything. Yeah, they're like, don't um, protest here. And I'm like, I'm like, what? Oh, okay. Like, I don't, like, I, I'm done. Like, what do you want from me? Yeah, I'll clean out some, some additionally questionably constitutional behavior from people who are most definitely not legal scholars, the U.S. Marshals in Boston. Um, you know, while you were out of the room, right, my attorney, who I, I have had some, some issues with these attorneys. I, I don't, don't find them to be very zealous. But even she was like, look, they don't, they can't close the courtroom. They can't, like, keep Dana out. Like, the, you know, the, there's things that they can't do. Like, they can't do this. And I'm like, well, they kind of seem to be trying or maybe <laughs> taking a swing at it. Um, so anyway, the, the rest of the hearing kind of goes on, right? And originally my attorney was going to ask to have the part of that hearing be ex parte and just the judge and, and us. And if my attorney had done that, I was going to say, no, actually, leave leave the courtroom open. Like, I prefer this to be in the open. I, like, I, I did not want to be the one seen, like, requesting any kind of secrecy. I don't, I don't feel that there's any need for any secrecy. I prefer things to be on the open here. But the judge was actually like, okay, I'm going to seal the courtroom. And at that point, I was like, okay, I'm not going to go against the judge. <laughs> like, I would go against my defense attorney if she made the motion, but I was not going to go against the judge. Um, so we had our, our little bit uh, there, and it was mostly just, you know, asking about what had, what had happened, and nothing was really covered that wasn't additionally in the motion. Um, but then, uh, you know, afterwards, uh, David Diadio, this stellar human being, this just just wonderful Harvard graduate who was, who was so, so concerned about those human rights that that Harvard just, you know, Harvard just, just swoons over, right? He he feels the need to, to weigh in on a couple of parts of my, my motion here. And, he, and as you expect from these people, he basically lied through his teeth and got everything wrong, you know, just like Boston Children's Hospital did to Justina, unfortunately. Um, and I kind of want to get at a couple of things that, that he actually managed to get on, on the record here. Um, you know, one of them, I mentioned in the motion that the government threatened Dana over posting uh, a legally obtained clip of, of court audio. And he, he outright denies this. He says the government never threatened the defendant's wife. Dana, what happened? What, what happened on the phone call between my attorney and, and, and you? What was said when they actually sent my attorney to contact you about that, that video and ask for it to be taken down? What, what did the government imply? Um... Yeah, when I was talking with Peachy, she said um, the government said I had to take down the video, and then if I did, then they wouldn't investigate me, which means if I left it up, they would investigate me. Like I. And this is the Boston FBI folks talking about investigating things. All right, so they don't investigate the hospital; they do investigate me. You know, this is. So, did you feel threatened, Dana, when when she was tell, telling you this? Yes, I don't. I don't. Do you like think that. that was the intent? Do you think that was that, that that was what they were trying to do to intimidate you? Yeah, I think they were trying to use it as leverage. I mean, we've seen them do that before. That remember when they said, um, "If you what was it like? If you take a plea deal, we won't look into your computer." Like this is just like how they. This is just one of the tricks in their bag of like how they pressure people. They're just bullies. Yeah, but I, I love that they try to act like they didn't. They didn't threaten you after this, and then. You know, another thing that he says, right, he says, you know, the defendant is, is trying to try this case in the media instead of the courtroom because he can just make stuff up in the media and, like, whatever. He basically took a shot at the media, saying, like, the media was printing a whole bunch of stuff that's not true, which is hilarious because he, he's lying through his teeth. And the media has actually been pretty good. And we've, we've had great coverage on both sides of the aisle on this. And, and there have been some mistakes made. They're, they're made in good faith, unlike the government, which just has lied, and we'll get more into that. And the media usually takes corrections, but not always. And even if the media doesn't take corrections, you can always come to us and we'll issue the corrections or say, you know, hey, this wasn't quite right, that wasn't quite right. Even when it doesn't benefit us, we, we go out of our way to do that. Uh, unlike the government, which just lies in sworn court paperwork. So, I, you know, I found that pretty you know, just rich uh, of them. But, you know, the Daily Wire contacted the U.S. Attorney's Office about this threat against Dana. And there, there's an article about it at the Daily Wire. Um, and, and the Daily Wire asked them, like, are you fucking serious about this? And they said, yeah, we're going we're gonna to bring it before a judge. We'll leave it up to the judge to decide. The Daily Wire goes, well, how can this 
be anything illegal. She obtained the recording legally. You know, that's for the judge to decide. And they told my, me through my attorney as well, they're, they, they're going to bring us up with the judge the next chance they get. Well, then the Daily Wire runs their article, and Michelle Malkin tweets, leave Dana Gottesfeld alone. <laughs> they do a quick about face. Now, they were in front of the judge today. They had, they had the opportunity to raise this issue and said, oh, no, we never threatened her. No, 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 we never, he, he's lying. We, we never threatened her. <laughs> and that, that article is on the record. That call happened on the record with, with journalists. Uh, yeah. You know, they lied about the Opjustina video, too. They said it called for an attack. And both Newsweek and the New American have called them out on this. And you can just go watch the video yourself, right? And they said in the, in the search warrant affidavit, in the criminal complaint, you know, this video calls for an attack. And journalists have watched the video. People have watched the video. No, it doesn't. Um, they said that this video, the notes to it, contained detailed information about the Boston Children's Hospital web server. Okay, uh, a public IP address that results from a dig of a public DNS record and a Netcraft-style examination of server headers to tell you the version of the web server is not what anyone in the industry would consider detailed information. <laughs> it fails every test for that that any reasonable professional could make. And yet they, they not only made this statement in writing, the government, they swore to it under oath. Um, and again, debunked by Newsweek and, and the New American. And once again, the government saying, here's the media getting stuff wrong, and you know, here's the government getting stuff wrong, and the media calling them out on it. Um, Dana, also, what did we hear from the hosting company that's kind enough to donate the hosting for the Free Marty G website? And I'm sorry, we don't have the name of the hosting company now. We're going to link to them in the notes for this show. And I think you might want to really consider using their services when you, when you hear the rest of this. What did, what did we hear from them today, Dana? Um, he told me that... Uh he saw the FBI in the IP logs on the Free Marty G website that they're trying to okay. get in through the back end. Oh, so they're, they're trying to actually hack the website, huh? Oh, well, actually, let me read his quote. Um, he, he was saying something about the IP logs. Um, okay, well, while we're, while we're getting that, um, the government also – made this statement about TCP and UDP port numbers, that they are dialing, routing, addressing, or signaling information, none of which is true. They said at a layer further insulated than that, right? An IP address is an address information. An Ethernet address, a MAC address, is address information, right? Um, what do you call it? Routing information on the Internet is IP, right? Generally speaking, routers on the Internet do not look at UDP and TCP port numbers. In fact, you have ICMP traffic. Routed and addressed on the Internet all the time does not even contain TCP and UDP port numbers. And the government's calling it that. And the government's also saying that this information does not give it anything about the substance, meaning, or purport of communications. And any professional can tell you a TCP UDP port number actually tells you a lot about the meaning of communication most of the time. Uh, so it's just an outright lie that they, they swore to, again, on the, the Penn Register tab and trace affidavit. I don't have a media organization that's called them out on that yet, uh, because this document theoretically is under seal, right? And so they're supposed to be able to keep this lie away from prying eyes, right? But again, here they are lying through their teeth, uh, and yet they want to accuse the media <laughs> of getting this wrong when the media is calling them out. Um, Dana, do you have the name of that hosting company, or do you have the quote from the hosting company, or should we keep moving on for now? Um, yeah, uh, I don't have the name of the um, of the hosting company. Um, do you have the quote or what he said? Um, yeah, he said um, he also noticed when he was reviewing some logs and some IP scopes that belonged to your government was trying to sneak into Marty's site on your box uh, so I can give you those logs and maybe you can use it in court. Uh, he also thinks the same logs should be visible inside of Joomla. Um, and asked me to take a look. Okay, yeah, but with me on the inside, folks, like, I I'm not going to be able to analyze these logs. I very much doubt that the court will care or do anything. Um, you know, but this is the type of thing that we could take to the media because there is no other remedy available here. 
I mean, that's basically the sad truth. So they leave you no other remedy besides the media, and then they complain that you go to the media, and then they lie and say the media is lying <laughs> when the media actually is getting this stuff right and doing its job, calling the government out on this abhorrent behavior. You know, this is how much these people hate the First Amendment. You know, they gag the Pelletiers. I'm sure they would love to gag me. They're going to try to take every shot they can at the media that's been, you know, effectively calling them out. Um, and then they can't even look at a picture of Justina, and they can't match eyes with me. They will not make eye contact with me. They literally look down to avoid making eye contact with me at this point. That is the level of cowardice and shame that Adam Bookbinder and David Diadio at the Boston U.S. Attorney's Office have. So then another kind of lie that they try to perpetuate, and, you know, we had um, Channel 5 ABC come to the hearing today. And they did a minute and a half segment. It's, it's really quite good. Um, there are only two kind of slight issues with it. One was um, the headline on their website is, is factually inaccurate. It says that, you know, I disrupted the hearing by chewing this guy out. The reality is the hearing had not started yet. The judge was not there, like I said. The hearing did start on time. It ran through just fine. There was no disruptions. There were no issues while the judge was there, while the hearing was called to order. Um, so this is one little correction on the ABC piece, but the content of the ABC piece itself was actually quite good, except that they repeated this kind of government mantra that, oh, there's, you know, potential, or there might have been, you know, potential risk to patients or something along those lines of patient data, right? And this was debunked by me in the Huffington Post. It was debunked by Rolling Stone on their own, and they had fact checkers call the hospital, you know what I mean? Um, and it was debunked by Red State, and I'm sure it's been debunked by others. Um, and this is a lie the government keeps trying to perpetuate because it's basically the only way that they can try to keep any level of public support. You know, once you take that, that main lie away, right, the fact that Justine is in this wheelchair and what the people who put her in the wheelchair are claiming they lost some money, but they're not getting prosecuted for putting her in the wheelchair and they're not getting prosecuted for accepting hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of taxpayer money, Medicaid money, to treat Justina for a condition at some point, they realized she does not have, right? But they didn't want to hold up to it, right? So they kept taking the government money to, to treat her for the psychological condition she doesn't have. And, like, the lying and all that, that's, you know, awful. And, and you know, you can make an argument that, okay, the abhorrent treatment of Justina itself didn't actually violate a federal law. There's no federal law against denying someone their medication in the hospital. You know, that becomes like a civil kind of issue. But there is a federal law against taking federal money to treat a patient for a condition you know they don't have. That's health care fraud. Uh, and they won't, you know, they're not going after that at all. Um, you know, instead they make this bogus allegation that, you know, some patient data could have potentially been compromised. I mean, does that make any sense to you folks? Would you bring a family member to a hospital where the Internet goes down and their data ends up in someone else's hands? or something like that, it just doesn't It doesn't make sense on its face. And it's just another lie the government perpetuates while calling out the media for what, getting the story right for the most part. Um, the government also took exception to my selective and vindictive prosecution motion. That was never filed. I had an agreement with a previous attorney who took another job in Washington, D.C., and came off the case. He had told the court he was going to file this motion. Um, we had an agreement to file this motion. The new lawyer who I had, you know, that wasn't selected by me, came on the case. The motion was not filed. Um, and, you know, Diadio acts like he knows my attorney-client privilege conversations, which he clearly doesn't or would have gotten more stuff right. But he infers that the reason this motion wasn't filed is because no lawyer could ethically file it. Um, and that's certainly not the case. I mean, the, the lawyer who was going to file this thing is one of the most experienced public defenders in Boston. That's why he got tapped for the job in D.C., you know, this guy knows his stuff, supposedly. I, I didn't have a problem so much working with him except for one thing around where, where my dad died. Um, you know, Dana, are you going to say something? No, go ahead. Okay. Um, and so, yeah, this is, you know, they don't go after the people who put the girl in the wheelchair. And they've gone after some really tenuous fraud cases that have blown up in their face. I'm thinking about the O'Brien Tavares probation case that got flipped and thrown out in December, a couple of days before Carmen Ortiz finally did the world a giant favor and quit. <laughs> um, that, that one really shamed her out of out of office. And that was a, a fraud case they pursued. The, the, the appellate court took a look at it and said, even if everything you're saying is right, 
there's still not a crime here. It's still not fraud. <laughs> That's literally what that case was. It wasn't that the government, you know, it was like, okay, government, we, we see what you're alleging, but even if everything you're saying is true, it's still not a crime. So see you later. And then we all know about the Top Chef case, where they were the same thing. They said, you know, all oh, these these teamsters, these truck drivers, uh, are guilty of racketeering uh, and extortion, um, try to defraud, you know, Top Chef out of, you know, money for superfluous jobs. The jury laughed them out of the courtroom. Complete acquittal, all four defendants, every single charge. Uh, <laughs> but they won't go after the hospital. It's pretty clearly guilty on its face. Uh, instead, they, they come after me, and then they try to say, well, yeah, he has no ethical right to file a selective and vindictive prosecution motion. You know, okay, guys. Um, and then, okay, the, one of the last things I wanted to bring up, um, you know, in the motion, I mentioned the conflicts of interest of the magistrate who signed the search warrant and took five months in violation of the Bail Reform Act to issue a bail finding in my case. Now, her name is Mary Ann Bowler. And the interesting things about Mary Ann Bowler, and again, she took this case, <laughs> knowing all this stuff, and this is in the written record of the case that she knew this stuff. Uh, she is on a board, she's a board member, or was a board member, is now a board member emeritus of a philanthropic organization called the Boston Foundation. Now, the Boston Foundation gave at least one grant that we know of to Wayside Youth and Family Support Network, and there is still a page on their website where you can donate through the Boston Foundation to Wayside Youth and Family Support Network. And Wayside Youth and Family Support Network is, of course, one of the places that tortured Justina. They're named in the criminal complaint. They're named in my indictment. Uh, and, and they're named in the search warrant. Uh, all the stuff that Bowler kind of signed off on, except that the criminal complaint was actually another judge. Bowler was, was out of her way. But she signed off on the search warrant. And it came up at the bail hearing, and she didn't, didn't recuse herself. And, you know, the government has their choice of which magistrate to go to for these things. They can literally go to any magistrate in town. But they, they chose her. Um, and, you know, I addressed this in, in, in my motion. You know, and the government just, they don't want to touch, touch that with a 10-foot pole. They didn't bring it up. They didn't, you know, there are tons of things they didn't talk about. They just kind of picked the arguments they thought they could, they could try to fool somebody who wasn't going to do a lot of research is the way it appears, at least to me. And... Um, and they didn't bring that one up at all. And, you know, it's just all the stuff of accusing the media of making stuff up when really it's the government that's just been lying since day one. It's just like they accused Justina of making up her symptoms, or accused the family of making up the mito diagnosis. These so-called Harvard human rights warriors, when they're caught in a lie, when their back's against the wall, they figure just lie, lie, lie some more, accuse other people of making stuff up, and, and, you know, they're all Harvard affiliates, so people are going to believe them. Except in this case, the media has actually been doing its job. And the United States Attorney's Office hates that and, and took an unfair shot at the media, which has actually been doing its, its job in a functioning democracy of fact-checking these bastards and calling them out on it when they lie through their teeth. Now, I have a question for you. I always, I always wonder this. Do you think that they know that they're lying and they are just, like, bad people, or they really believe into the bullshit that they're trying to spew? Well, I think, I think in most cases they know. In some cases, maybe they don't. Like, the TCP UDP port numbers, like, you've got to basically have failed Network Plus or failed CCNA to not get that right. Like, the idea that you've got a whole cybercrime office at the Boston FBI that doesn't know those statements were factually wrong and, and breaking the law, you know, that I, I, it's very, very difficult to believe. Um, you know, the fact that they, uh, what do you call it, that they, they, they don't want to talk about the Bowler thing, like they knew what magistrate they were bringing that to. That's why they brought it to her. Like, I, I don't think that they were unaware of the conflict of interest there. Um, I don't see how they could be. It's on her official bio. Like, she's it's all over her Facebook. Like, this is not stuff that this, this magistrate judge is going out of the way to hide. Um, right. And then also, why is there no mea culpa now? Why is there no, oh, we're sorry about that. We didn't realize. No, why aren't they issuing corrections? You know, when, when something gets published, it's not quite right. Like I said, you can go to incarcerated, and we'll call it out. Right? You can go to our Facebook post. We'll call it out. <laughs> like, we've been like, why aren't they doing that? I think that really shows the, the guilt 
on their part and the knowledge of the guilt on their part. Like, these are sworn court documents that these misstatements are on, and yet there's no effort to correct the record. That, to me, shows the real guilt. Like, they know what they're doing. Because if you make an honest mistake, the honest thing to do is to come forward and say, I made a mistake, I'm sorry, the real reality is this, this, and that. We don't see them doing that. No. I, you know, I, I think it's just a little bit of, like, night, like, wishful naivete. Like, oh, they don't know. As soon as we explain it to them, they'll be cool. And it's like, no, that's not how it works in federal court. They want convictions above all else, above justice, about doing what's right. They just want notches in their belt to advance their own careers. Well, I think that's true in most cases. I think in my case, though, it's actually even more insidious than that. You know, these people are defending their alma mater's affiliated children's hospital. Like, I went to Phillips Exeter, okay? I can tell you a large part of the selling point of going we to have, like that. We have some of an, somewhat of an international audience. Can you tell us what that is? Like, what um, it's one of the most elite uh, boarding schools uh, in the United States. Sends more kids to Harvard than to, than to, than to any other college. Um and you have these elite schools, both at the high school and the, and the college level, you know, in the United States. And you have them over in the U.K., too, with, like, Eton and um, Oxford and Cambridge. People people know about this kind of thing, right? And the, one of the points of going to one of these schools is the lifelong connections and kind of the, the fraternity, um, right, that, you know, look out for other members of this, of this community, right? And so this is, you know, at every level you can follow the connections here to Harvard, right? This is Harvard protecting Harvard. And this is all of the concerns are secondary. The truth is secondary. Everything else is secondary for them to protecting this cabal, right? And this this goes from Diadio and Bookbinder to Marion Bowler, who worked at Harvard Medical School and is married to a professor at Harvard Medical School, which oversees the children's hospital in question. Yet she doesn't recuse from the case. And, again, I think the fact that she doesn't recuse from the case speaks volumes because, you know, why wouldn't you? I had two trial judges recused for much, much more tenuous reasons than an actual financial tie to, like, raising money for one of these people. And she did not recuse. Um, so, and even when she started getting called out in the media, we got Daily Wire headlines about it. She still did not recuse. Um, you know, I think at that point, it was she, her hand was caught in the cookie jar. Um, but that's what this is about for them. That's why these Harvard-affiliated prosecutors went to a Harvard Medical School-affiliated magistrate to kind of do all this stuff. And then that brings up, like, to me, what's, what's kind of another why of theirs that keep trying to perpetuate. And that's that, you know, I was somehow fleeing justice. And it's like, well, in order for me to have been fleeing justice, which I wasn't, justice would have to be what they are, in fact, pursuing, which it is not. Like, whatever they're pursuing, it's not justice. And so if you want to say I was fleeing something, okay, but don't say I was fleeing justice, because that's not what's going on here. That's not why. The, that's why this podcast is named Incarcerated. <laughs> that's why it's not mm-hmm. named Incarcerated. That's why it's named Incarcerated. Yeah. Because they're not pursuing justice here. Justice would be trying to do something for the little girl in the wheelchair. That would be justice. So no, no Dana. I don't, I don't think. Like I think in some cases maybe they they mess up. I've seen a couple of things that I think maybe could have started off as like a good faith mistake. But then when they choose to just compound that mistake and dig their heels in on it instead of just owning up, then it's no longer a good faith mistake. Yeah. At that point, it stops being that. Wow, we might have actually gotten through this whole agenda with a little time to spare. <laughs> That's so rare for us folks. I, I, I know I'm kind of a, a windbag. Uh, I apologize for that. Um, it's makes, make, it makes writing a thousand word article very difficult, believe me. We have editors come back to us all the time, like, you gotta cut 300 words, you gotta cut 400 words, and like, oh, what do I take out? Mm-hmm. You know, I'm a technical guy, engineers, we love long technical documents. Mm-hmm. I, I love me a nice 30, 50 page spec. That's, that's a fun night for me. Um, so it's been real tough trying to get things down to size, especially with a case like this. You have um, one minute remaining. Okay. Ah, there we go. The Not that much warning. time left to spare. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. I guess we got it in uh, just about the right amount of time. Um, so, folks, look for the name of that hosting company with the notes for the, the show tonight. Because if you want somewhere the FBI can't break into or, better yet, we'll get caught breaking into, I mean, these guys, that they did it. Um, 
And then, yeah, so this, this, this phone time is very expensive. We've been very fortunate this week to have a lot of donations because InfoWars um, sent a lot of traffic to our site, and we're very, very grateful to them for that. And they got the facts right, um, unlike the government who wants to take shots at, you know, outlets like InfoWars and whatever. They got the facts right. The government didn't. The government's lying. Um, but, you know, the phone time for this is still very expensive. It costs about 7 or $8 to do one of these recordings. So if you could donate at freemartyg.com, um, we would really appreciate it. It would help us do this show on a more frequent basis. We were doing it more frequently, and, and we didn't, just didn't have the money to keep doing it. But we'd like to keep doing it. Um, yeah, I think that's about it uh, for me. Dana, do you have anything? Thank you for using Global Tellink.